so yeah, Twitter handles. There we go. Um, uh, so I'm going to be talking about old stuff, and um, my name was given to me before the internet existed and has turned out to be internet unique, which is one of those convenient things. So if you haven't had children yet, you can do this for them, okay? You can Google their names before you give them their names and just check that the combination is actually unique. I had, I've done this for both of my kids. And it, it's, you know, it's like, uh, it, uh, it, so when my older son turned 13 a few years ago, it's just like, Dad, what shall I, what shall I claim as my Twitter handle? And can I get my domain name? I said, yeah. It's just like they're available. Wow. Yeah, that moment was 13 years in the making. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about old stuff because one of the things I've discovered and noted is that when you, when you work at this stuff for long enough, you start seeing some of the same things coming up. But they're not always identical. and We don't always identify their deeper principles. And I would like to go back to the fact that we miss a few things. There's so much going on. And we're very bad at propagating knowledge. For a knowledge-based industry, we're not very good at actually being um, knowledge propagators. And, uh, so let, let's talk about this stuff. So um, uh, Andre G put this rather nicely. Everything has been said before, but since nobody listens, we must always start again. Which, if you are a consultant, this is great news. OK? <laughs> this is, is uh, so we're going to talk about Shakespeare. Um, because it turns out he was a, he was a programmer. Um, and uh, this goes back a few hundred years, 400 years ago. The uh, lack of computers was certainly a problem. Um, um, but he tended to favor scripting. Um, and he used the actor model for execution. Um, uh, it doesn't get better than this, by the way. Uh, but there in one of his plays, we can actually see he explores some of the issues um, that we have explored in recent decades. Um, so in Hamlet, um, which I'm going to do a bit of free advertising here, because on the way here, I suddenly realized, I spotted, there is a production of Hamlet in Dusseldorf next week. If you want to feel cultured and educated and watch a play <laughs> about, watch a play about memory management. <laughs> oh, yes. This is a play about memory management. D don't, don't be under any illusions that it's anything else. Uh, it's carefully disguised as a tragedy of the Prince of Denmark. But look, to be or not to be, that is the question. Is that not the most fundamental question of memory management? And in the play are explored two different themes, two different approaches. We have Ophelia. Tis in my memory locked, and you yourself shall keep the key of it. It seems that Ophelia favors the C and C++ approach of explicit memory management. You mallocked it, you free it. You nude it, you delete it. OK? Bad things happen otherwise. Hamlet's a little more garbage collection, you know? Yay, from the table of my memory, I will wipe away all trivial fond records. So. Hamlet's going for garbage collection. You can see the whole play is really about this, once you understand the true subtext that Shakespeare was trying to uh, give us. It is, the, it is the tragedy of memory management. And when we explore this, we actually see that this is not a, this is not a new thing. There was a bit of a crossover in the 1990s. But if we go back, Lisp. So sometimes people cite Lisp as a language of the 1950s. That's not strictly true. It was designed in 1958 and 59, but the first active implementation was not available until 1960. Um, then this was followed by the programmer's manual. Uh, this is my copy of the programmer's manual. Um, I quite like old books. Um, there's something about them. It's, it's very well written. Um, you can find the PDF for free online. It's quite instructive because you get a very different view because you couldn't just download stuff. They actually tell you, uh, they actually tell you how to create Lisp on a machine. So they take it apart piece by piece. And there's a lot of wisdom in there. It's actually quite well written as well. This was garbage collected. But it wasn't the only game in town. Algol 68, a language that was way ahead of its time. Um, uh, this had garbage collection. Simula 67, the language that gave us object orientation, that had garbage collection. These ideas were around for a long, long time. 
And Algol 68 is probably the most influential language you've either never used or never heard of. Okay, right, right down to little bits and pieces, like these little words. This is where these words came from. Because it turned out, up until this point in the 1960s, people had been typing integer. But then the Algol 68 folks came along and said, you don't need to type all those letters. We can reduce it to int. And they gave us words like char, because character was just, that's why so many languages didn't support character-based manipulation, because character was just too hard to type. So char, short, the whole short, long chaos that was introduced with Algol 68. Union, struct, these are, there's a whole load of concepts here which when you go back to them are surprisingly fresh and only making appearance in our mainstream languages in the last decade or so. Um, it also had um, anonymous procedures, um, which um, are better known as lambdas, which people have been getting very excited about the last few years. I've not been able to work out why, given that they're actually quite old. Um, so, uh, speaking of old, this is a book I co-authored, uh, Doug Schmidt and Frank Bushman, um, or two books even. It was originally going to be one book, but we kind of missed the scope. Um, um, and I have a, a long-standing interest in patterns, and one of the key observations about patterns is that they are mostly about ideas that already exist. They're not about new ideas. With patterns, what you're trying to do is say, here's a thing that other people have done. Here is why it works. Here is when it works. Here is when it does not work. Um, so you really understand the shape and thought behind an idea. And most people, unfortunately, when they hear about patterns, they immediately go singleton. Um, and uh, there is a good singleton. Um, just in case you're not aware, singleton, bad pattern, bad, don't use it. There is a good singleton. It's the one on the right. It's a uh, single malt whiskey. It will improve the quality of your code. Okay. The other singleton does not, <laughs> because you have a choice. You have a, you have a choice. You can sit there. I used to use an image from, I used to use an image from the Singleton Distillery website, but people it was so clean. People thought I'd photoshopped it. So here's here, this is this is my singleton in my office, um, uh, and that singleton, when you're sitting there with your code in front of you, and you think, you know, shall I put a big global variable in? Let me have a drink and it just slowly dissolves away all those bad thoughts about using the singleton pattern, and your code improves. It's great. But what I want to focus on is this. There is no patterns manifesto. A few years ago, when there were a number of people going through a, manifest a manifesto phase, um, I thought it was unfair that patterns didn't have a manifesto. And this was around the time of the Sir manifesto, 2011, I think. And I was running a pattern mining workshop at a company in Norway. And I said, well, if patterns had a manifesto, what would it be? And it would be the simple idea of taking the knowledge and sharing it. We've just discovered something. This is really great. Other people should try and use it. It may not work for you, but let us show you how it worked for us. Simple as that. We are uncovering better ways of developing software by seeing how others have already done it. Uh, as um, Brian Foote, the patterns community, said, patterns are an aggressive disregard of originality. It's probably why the academics aren't really very keen on them. Because the whole point of a pattern is you go around, it's not original. You're saying, look, we've seen this idea here, here, and here. It solves this problem particularly well. And it could be a problem in distributed computing. It could be a problem in programming language design. It could be a problem of security. It could be a problem of organizational structure. When you've seen it, recognize it, capture it, give it a name, try and understand under what circumstances it works and under what circumstances it ceases to work. And then you can pass that knowledge on. But the patterns community, I'm not really going to focus so much on the patterns as a number of key ideas that came from that and uh, people who were associated with it. Uh, Richard Gabriel uh, now works for IBM, formerly of Sun. He published this book in the mid-1990s, Patterns of Software. And it's not just about patterns, it's very much a autobiographical, it's about software, software industry as it was at the time in the late 80s and the early 90s. But in it he also captured something he'd been developing since around 1990. Um, in 1990 I proposed a theory called worse is better. 
of why software would be more likely to succeed if it was developed with minimal invention. Now, one of the things that you know in software development is that naming is hard. Naming is really hard. Worse is better is possibly one of the worst names he could have chosen for this. <laughs> because worse is better for a lot of people means, oh, okay, if we just do a, if we just do a hack job, then that's good enough. <laughs> no, 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 that actually has a name given to it by Ed Jordan. That was called good enough software. That's actually slightly different. Worse is better. The more you look at it, the less worse it becomes. So for a start, we can see something strange would be more likely to succeed if it was developed with minimal invention. That doesn't sound like it's worse. It sounds like a form of minimalism. That's more like less is more. And as we progress, he's advocating it is far better to have an underfeatured product that is rock solid, fast, and small than one that covers what an expert would consider the complete requirements. So when most people say, oh, we should make it worse, you don't immediately think, no bugs as fast as possible and really small. You normally think the exact opposite. Worse means more bugs, hideous pile of code, um, and slow as anything. So what he's actually saying is it's worse with respect to scope. But that's a tiny fraction of what we normally assume in the context of the word worse. But I want to focus on this, because this is around 1990. He developed the idea through the 90s. I was involved in a conference panel um, on worse is better uh, at one point. And what we see here is a foreshadowing not only of a number of agile ideas, but all, even more specifically a number of the lean ideas and particularly lean startup. And it gives us a sense of how what he's doing is he phrases this is 1990, but he's actually going back to the 80s and 90, uh, 80s, 70s, and 60s to draw his lessons. Here are the characteristics of a worse is better software design. Simplicity. The design is simple in implementation. The interface should be simple, but anything adequate will do. Um, completeness. Design covers only necessary situations. Put another way, this is scope management. This is scope management. This is exactly what people focus on in terms of uh, their delivery structure. This is a really good example. This is the top and tail of... Um, the original wiki. The original wiki code, so wiki is, the whole wiki idea comes from Ward Cunningham. And this is 1995. There's about 150 lines of Perl, which is possibly my least favorite language. But it also shows you that favorites matter uh, not at all when it comes to the capability. If it's the tool for the job, it's the tool for the job. And 150 lines of Perl. That's basically what launched the whole wiki concept. The original wiki, I, I participated in it. Um, clearly, the code base grew a little bit, but the original wiki was a, such a simple idea, the idea of editable web content filled with conventions. It was so lightweight. If you had given it to an enterprise team, you'd have had to give it to at least two enterprise teams and waited maybe 18 months, two years, and what you'd have got would have been disappointing. But here, this is, a, this is a small piece of code. It just starts it. You make it so simple that you can actually throw it away. And this is a really interesting idea behind Worse is Better, that if you are able to reduce the scope and understand what you are trying to build, you can throw it away if you need to and move on to the next step. Don't let that old code get you down because you've learned the lessons that you need. You're able to move forward. Correctness. The design is correct in all observable aspects. Yeah, make it work. Do remember testing. It's quite a nice idea. Consistency. The design is consistent as far as it goes. Okay, But it's less of a problem because you always choose the smallest scope for the first implementation. So here we have a philosophy of product design that is based on start small, get it out there, and see what happens. And this is definitely before the era that we now associate with that philosophy of design, which is internet distribution. I mean, people were, this is 1990, okay? If you, wanted to, if you wanted to load new software onto your machine, you got yourself a whole load of floppy disks that were, oh, we were at 1990, we were in the transition between five and a quarter and three and a half inch, yeah? I actually showed my kids these, and it's just, what the hell's that, Dad? It's that, uh, yeah. Um, so that's the transition. And if you wanted to load a compiler or an operating system onto your machine, you went over to your hi-fi, you put on some music, 
preferably a long play, and you fed the machine. We were slaves to the machine. That has not changed. We are still slaves to the machine. Okay? But now it's, the, uh, now it's our likes that we want. It just used to take three and a half inch floppy disks to feed it. Now, now they, want, they want our data, our souls. Um, so here's an interesting point. So this is, a, this, is, this is the philosophy of design that goes back to this era. And here's an observation. The design process is an iterative one. It comes from Andy Kinslow. It comes from this document here. There are two things I want you to note. Well, perhaps three things. One is the year, 1968. Two is the location and the event. This was the um, NATO-sponsored software engineering uh, conference, which has been very, very influential and massively misunderstood. A lot of people think, ah, this is the, this is the conference that gave us the phrase software engineering. This is the conference that gave us the words software crisis. Um, <sighs> Software crisis takes about a page. That's it. That's not really what the whole conference is about. Um, the word software engineering was not coined by this conference. But the other thing I'd like you to note is that uh, this is a use of the rather nice Futura font, but actually the original font, um, the original typeface was uh, Gil Sons, which is very, it's a very nice, that's, they're only about a year apart, 1927, 1928. Um, but this is very much of its time. Somehow this represents the 60s. Um, Speaking of the 60s, this is Margaret Hamilton. She invented the term software engineering. Um, she uh, was responsible for uh, leading the team at MIT to de develop the Apollo guidance uh, computer uh, software. Um, and she came up with crazy little ideas like, you know, maybe we should make it fault tolerant. Um, because she would ask questions, what happens if the system overloads? And she would be told by other people, this system will not overload. <laughs> yes, but what happens if it does? <laughs> you know those things people tell you? Oh, that'll never happen. She was not satisfied with this answer. Apparently, she actually took her, her daughter in one day uh, to work, and um, apparently, apparently young children are as good as cats for testing software. And that's exactly what her daughter did, accidentally. Um, but it turns out that she basically saved the mission. Um, there would have been no Apollo 11 landing had it not been uh, for the um, uh, fault tolerance. She, had, she put in a priority system that ditched um, uh, unnecessary work um, uh, that was overloading the process. It was known as the 1202 error and the 1201 error that uh, she dealt with, um, uh, her software dealt with. And she said, I began to use the term software engineering to distinguish it from hardware and other kinds of engineering. But what is interesting here is yet treat each type of engineering as part of the overall systems engineering process. I like this kind of perspective that she's got. It's not just software. She wants software to have a seat at the table. Because back in the 1960s, software was a, was a secondary feature. The hardware was the main cost element. That was just beginning to change. Companies that produced software were also companies that produced hardware. And this was just beginning to start changing. And so, so that, that notion here of the importance of it's a big picture, we're part of it, but you cannot exclude it, and we're not the only game in town. So back to this. Other observations, because sometimes people think, you know, the software engineering conference, it, it basically put in place plan-driven development. People have been suffering from this ever since. And the waterfall process. Here's an observation from Douglas Ross. The most deadly thing in software is the concept, which almost universally seems to be followed, that you are going to specify what you are going to do and then do it. And this is where most of our troubles come from. You can go through the document and find loads of people saying very similar things. This was not unique. Although there were a diverse range of voices, not everybody agreed with everything, it's surprising how much um, agreement there was on these points. So. Implementation characteristics. Let's talk about worse is better. Implementation characteristics. Uh, the implementation should be fast. There's a whole philosophy here about speed. Speed matters. Speed is the one thing you can always apply to make your system faster, or rather, make your system more usable. When you make something fast, it is immediately more usable. Okay, it's just a, it's a, a simple human thing. We also see it at the code level. This dates from the mid-1990s. It's one of my favorite pieces of advice on optimization. Okay? Remember that there is no code faster than no code. Until somebody invents a tachyon pipeline 
for processors, there, this is going to remain true. And I think that I've just realized that that would be a great April Fool's. We're coming up to 1st of April. A tachyon pipeline for hardware. If you're not sure what a tachyon is, T-A-C-H-Y-O-N, you have Google. OK, but this again itself is not new. Um, John Bentley's advice and Programming Pearls, a collection of some of his articles from the 1980s, the fastest I.O. is now I.O. That still has not changed. And the problem is that we have a very, we have a very poor memory for remembering that things change. And we assume, oh, well, we, we, we now have an abundance of um, memory. Our processor speeds are super fast. We don't have to worry about performance. Except that you do, because you have to worry about network. There's always something. There's always something that is a boundary. And this is a kind of a, a healthy reminder. This is a blog post from four years ago, Adam Drake. Command line tools can be over 200 times faster than your Hadoop cluster. Now, somewhere in the early two, somewhere in the mid 2000s to about five years ago, it was a case of like, right, distribute everything, push it out onto the network because the network will be faster because we have cheap computers and available network resources. The first, the first law of distributed computing is don't distribute. <laughs> okay? It's as simple as that. Because there is one thing you will never beat. That is the speed of light. It turns out that's non-negotiable. Okay? And that's your upper limit. A physical network is slower. Okay? This is much the disappointment of many software architects this is not available in a config file. You know, so, oh, that's a bit slow. Tell you what, let's just update it to be a little bit faster. This is your limit. The distance across the top of my laptop is one light nanosecond, which gives it a cycle time of one gigahertz, which suddenly doesn't sound very fast at all. That is, your, that is the limit. And if you ever look at the downloads, in fact, one of the best things is some of the US sites, some US news sites, I think, I can't remember which ones, but there are a couple of them, in order to comply with um, GDPR, decided not to use advertising. And suddenly they would download 10 times faster. Just shows you how much that bandwidth gets soaked up. But the key thing here is there's a healthy reminder. I used this in a workshop a while back. What I love here is he took a, a, big, a big data. I'll come back to that question of what is big uh, in a moment. He took a big data problem. and. He developed, he worked, worked it through in Java, Hadooped it, and then he decided to use some bash tools <laughs> on a local machine. It turns out memory is the thing that has changed most. Memory, if you can do it locally, do it locally. It doesn't matter. If somebody says, we've got a distributed solution, say, how much would the, me the extra memory cost? That is a better answer. And so he did this, and this is the kind of speed up he got. It's like a significant speed up just using scripting tools. Now, the point here is, and this, this, in the workshop, this came out, one guy said, oh, that's because a few years ago, that's because that, that the design was bad. We know better now. And that the one thing you should learn is that we don't, is that in 10 years' time, you'll be sitting there going, I don't believe we used to design it like that. Because this happens. If you look back at the things you did 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, what you will find is this recurring theme. There is always a limit. The limit may change, but there is always a limit, and you will hit it. And the next generation of computing will find new limits. You, know, you should be humble in the face of that. Um, you should also be humble when we come to talk about things like, how big is big data? Because if we go back to the end of the 20th century, one of the classic big data projects there was the Human Genome Project. The term big data had not yet been coined, but the human genome decoding Basically, the book of life. Wow, that's awesome. And I've seen it printed out. It's 23 volumes. It's huge, physically. And I saw it in a museum a few years ago with one of my kids. And he said, that's quite, you know, I said, that's pretty impressive. He said, yeah. But how much is that on a computer, Dad? Because I worked it out. I said, that's about three gigabytes. And as I said it, it's just like, that's not very much. You know, he looked at me and said, that's not that big, is it, Dad? No, it used to be worth a lot more. Three gigabytes used to be big data. These days, three gigabytes, you know, you can run that, you could run 
you could run that, and you could still have plenty of pictures for you know, space for pictures of cats and a few YouTube streams, you know, and you might even throw in, you might even be able to run one instance of Slack, but don't get too excited. <laughs> so the point here is our definition of big is a moving target. And so whatever it is that you think, oh, those people back in 2019, they had no computing resources. That's what you'll be thinking in 10 years' time. Yeah, that is always the thing. That is not you. We will always find the limit. And, and um, sadly, that's one we don't get to change. Everything else seems to move along. OK, the implementation should be fast. It should be small. It's good Dijkstra observed. My point today is that if we wish to count lines of code, we should not regard them as lines produced, but as lines spent. This is very old wisdom. And it's a case of you find yourself saying these things, and then you find that not only has somebody said it before, but they said it decades ago. So this is a rather interesting book. John Lyons, um, uh, University of New South Wales. Um, he, in the 1970s, he wanted to run an operating systems course. And he wanted to use a real operating system rather than a toy one. And at that point, around that time, um, the source code from Bell Labs um, was made available because it was considered against um, the, uh, uh, basically, the antitrust legislation meant that AT&T uh, could not compete in, these, um, uh, in the computing market. Um, so therefore, that this could not be considered a separate product. Um, this was made available. Now, what I find fascinating here, this, this became, you know, as you can, as you can see, this book, was, this book was not originally a book. It was originally passed around. It was a set of notes, and it was passed around by Samizdat. And people would just photocopy there. Now, I can see that some of you are young enough to not know what a photocopier is. <laughs> so I will explain it as a socialized form of scanning. OK? Um, uh, and, but it got published as a book. And in this book, we have the whole of <laughs> sixth edition kernel of Unix. It's about 10,000 lines of code. 10,000 lines. That's not a lot. I've seen classes that are larger than that, that have done less. <laughs> if somebody shows you a system, they, oh, sometimes people can wander around. It's just like, yeah, our system is this big. And it's just like, OK, what does it do? It's always more disappointing than it's an operating system. Yeah, We put money from here into here. Wow, OK. We move data from here into here and then back again. You know, that's a lot of our, a lot of our systems are reduced to that. And although you look at it and you think the coding style is a little dated, I also keep in mind that actually I've still seen worse code. And it was not as cleverly done. And we did not have the conventions um, and understanding that we do now. But interesting is um, the observations of the late Dennis Ritchie and uh, Ken Thompson. There have always been fairly severe size constraints um, on the Unix operating system and its software. Given the partially antagonistic desires for reasonable efficiency and expressive power, the size constraint has encouraged not only economy, but a certain elegance of design. Now, this is actually quite an interesting one. Is Often, we regard limits as being obstacles. But it turns out in the human creative process, um, uh, it doesn't matter if you're Knuth or Stravinsky, there's quotes from both. The idea of having a boundary, a limit, a constraint is actually required for uh, creativity. I mean, so, for example, I write short fiction. The form of short fiction I write most is a thing called flash fiction, which normally has a hard word count constraint. It might be 200 words, it might be 500 words. It depends on the competition or the context. And that suddenly makes you more creative. One of the worst things you could ever do to an artist is say, make me a picture. Oh, come on, that's terrible. Give me a constraint. OK, use charcoal. Use only the color blue. Use something that is this big. Use only this medium. Now, suddenly, you've got something. Yeah. If you ask somebody, create some music, that's terrible. Again, I want it on a guitar. Try it in a blues style, but 1930s. You know, this, suddenly, you're giving somebody something they can push against. And it turns out exactly the same thing, exactly the same creative processes are at play in software. So, um, welcome to Brexit Britain. <laughs> um, this, is, this is one of the computers, apparently, we're going to like, put a lot of funding into. 
Um, I believe it's going to be a replacement. It's a ground station for the replacement for Galileo system. Um, so here we have um, here we have a kind of an original computer, and it's your classic it's your classic legacy system. Okay, it's you know people look at it and go, well, why did they make it? Why did they build it? How does it work? You know, these practices that they use are really strange. Who maintains it? How, you know, the mystery is there, just like a real legacy system. Um, uh, but the reason I want to show it to you is because something that we have discovered over time when we create things is they become monoliths, monolithos, the Greek for one stone, one big immovable stone. And somehow, somehow, all of our systems, if we do not pay attention, gravitate towards this. It seems to be, it seems to be a law, second law of thermodynamics, to be precise. Things get messier. That hasn't changed. Software has not suddenly become more organized than it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. This is an invariant. Obviously, this is what we want instead. You know, our elegantly organized code base, you know, crisp, dynamic, small stones. A lot of people look at that and they go, oh, Kevlin, you're talking about microservices. And you know what I say? I say, if that helps you, then yes, I am. But I'm not really. I'm just, this is, a, this is we're actually going to see this is a, a common theme, this kind of decomposition. Um, this is the Unix philosophy, right? Programs that do one thing and do it well. So when people say, oh, microservices, this is a really new idea. Yeah. Like Unix is a new idea. So if we talk about microservices, the truth, sadly, is that these ideas go back further. Now, what is interesting about microservices, and I'll come to that in a moment, is the principles are all there. And it, this helps us understand why some ideas do not catch on or do not reach, um, do not become realized in the way that we are now familiar. So this is E.E. E. David, again in the software engineering um, conference in 1968. Define a subset of the system which is small enough to bring to an operational state and build on that subsystem. Now what I find interesting is that particular idea of bring to an operational state. He's not just talking about developing it, he means that it should be operational. That's a slightly that's a slight shift from the, the conventional view of modularity within a program. He's actually talking about an externally visible modularity. This strategy requires that the system be designed in modules, which can be realized, tested, and modified independently apart from the conventions for intermodule communication. This is really interesting. Now, what we see, what is the difference between this and how we do microservices? Well, one of the key differences goes back to, it turns out it's hardware. It's primarily hardware. Because if you're trying to propose a microservice-based architecture, 10 years ago, you're just on the edge. 20 years ago, people would laugh at you. What, you're going to launch a separate process for every single small action? That's ridiculous. What a stupid idea. You know? These days, we have the idea of serverless, which is better put as function as a service. Every function you call, you're going to launch as a separate service. That's insane. The cost of doing so is too high. But hardware and operating systems have improved to the point that that has become a possibility. So in other words, this was an idea that was waiting to happen, but it was not an idea that was, in that sense, truly original. It was waiting for the ecosystem. It was waiting for all the supporting software, but also the hardware changes, to come into play and make it a commodity. But we've been here before. Component software, 1990s. A software component is a unit of composition with contractually specified interfaces and explicit context dependencies only. A software component can be deployed independently and is subject to third-party composition. You can replace the word component with microservice there, and you end up with the same thing. In fact, I know I worked with somebody, and I shall not name him. I worked with somebody who did, did basically do that with, you know, whenever there was a new tech technology cycle, he would take his old PowerPoint slides and says, right, I've got to go and do a customer pitch on this technology. What have we got from where, okay, right, well, this is all about objects. I need to talk about components or services. Okay, let's just global replace 
object for service or whatever. It just whichever paradigm you're going for. Likewise, I visited a company. They were going through a lean transformation. What's the difference between that and their agile transformation? Uh, lean is spelled L-E-A-N. Agile is spelled A-G-I-L-E. That's pretty much it. That was the difference I could see. So if you went and looked at their strategy slides, that was the difference. Okay. It's because the, the Agile one hadn't worked out quite as well as they'd hoped. So we need to do this again. Can we come up with another word? Lean. Brilliant. So we're just going to come up with new words every few years. You know, I'm not saying they are the same, but I'm saying that they have sufficient overlap that when you come to actually look at the core idea, the core idea is still stable. So let's go back to 1964. Notes on the Synthesis of Form by Christopher Alexander. So this is my copy of his book. He's the guy who came up with design patterns, okay, the whole concept of patterns in building architecture in the 1970s. And I read this book in the 90s, but I didn't realize how influential he was because it turns out he got quoted in the 1968 Software Engineering Conference. It was absolutely fascinating when you look at what he was saying and the reason he was quoted. It turns out this was a very influential book in the 60s. Um, it was a very interdisciplinary book. We may therefore picture the process of form making as the action of a series of subsystems, all interlinked yet sufficiently free of one another to adjust independently in a feasible amount of time. He is talking, he's taking an approach to architecture that we can recognize in software architecture. He is talking about the looseness of coupling and why we have loose coupling. He is also talking about this idea of change within a unit within a subsystem. It works because the cycles of correction and recorrection, which occur during adaptation, are restricted to one subs subsystem at a time. He's talking about migration. He's talking about refactoring. He's talking about a whole load of things for which words do not exist at this point and yet apply across all classes of system. And you know, he drew up this nice little diagram. And it turns out that this is uh, sort of a very simple way to visualize a system. So. This is how we make things small. We make large things out of small things. Because it turns out that these brains are really good at the small stuff. But we are not good at conceiving of the large stuff. Or rather, humans can build large things. And we can see it in the form of cities. We can see it in the form of large code bases. The way we do that successfully and sustainably is by working on the small things that we can reason about. And this is an interesting thing, because it also tells us that software is recursive in some sense. You build big pieces of software out of smaller pieces of software. You build smaller pieces of software out of smaller pieces of software still. It's a recursive composition. This is very, actually very different to buildings. You don't build large buildings out of smaller buildings, generally. You, know, you don't take bricks and build bigger bricks out of them. Yeah? What happens in the physical world is you change scale, you change medium, you change the rules and the discipline that you're actually following. Whereas in software, it's turtles all the way down. So, Here's another interesting thing. We're going to talk about interoperation, because that came up. Here's a philosophy of, here's a philosophy of um, worse is better. It should interoperate with the programs and tools the expected uh, users are already using. In other words, it should fit with the ecosystem. Now, that's a very interesting idea, because it basically means half the work is already done for you. So we could not have done REST, for example, in a pre-HTTP era, because it didn't make sense. Okay? You couldn't do microservices in an earlier era because you simply wouldn't have the supporting tools to make them micro. You'd have had to code everything from the ground up. So there's an idea about fitting into a world that already exists. Yeah, again, that's not new. The second part of McElroy's rule, write programs to work together. Establish the conventions by which you have a discipline of composition. There are two sides to the history of code design. One is the side of decomposition. The other side is the side of composition, the opposite, putting things together. We spent a lot of time worrying about taking things apart. But it turns out that washing machine is not going to be able to work unless you put all the pieces back together again. I've, I've only mastered half of that process. Now, I can take a washing machine apart. The other part, I'm not so good at. But it turns out we need both sides in software. It should be bug-free. Whoa, radical. <laughs> but look at the suggestion. If that requires implementing fewer features, do it. 
He was advocating a very strong policy of reviewable code, testable code, and smaller code. Reduce the features until you have confidence. And once you've got confidence, you've got a thing that works, then you can build, you can take a, it's a lot easier to take a thing that works and make it into a bigger thing that works. It turns out that the strategy that is popular amongst many companies, let's make a really big thing and then try and fix it, not, does not work that well. So people wonder about you know, the fact that people are really into testing by comparison with where they were a few years ago. So here's Alan Perlis, 1968 again. A software system can best be designed if the testing is interlaced with the designing instead of being used after the design. In other words, don't test at the end. Test as you go. The question remains what happened in the 1970s because clearly we lost an awful lot. No, PC, that was the 1980s. I'm going to blame either disco or flared trousers. <laughs> uh, it's one of those. OK. So, but here, we can actually know. Here is the thing that happened in the 1970s. This idea of interleave testing and coding, how far can you take this? Um, so I've been talking about Unix. Um, Alfred Aho is one of the Unix demigods. Um, he co-developed, co-designed the ORC programming language. Um, uh, that was Aho, Weinberger, and Kerningen, AWK. Uh, Ork got displaced by Perl in the late 90s, mid to late 90s, and Perl is now being displaced by things called programming languages, which I'm not sad about because I don't like Perl. Um, so, but there's an elegance to the language Ork. But it's really interesting reading this interview with Alfred Aho about how they developed it. And he said at one point, we instituted a rigorous regression test for all the features of Ork. Any of the three of us who put in a new feature into the language first had to write a test for the new feature. There you go. Test-driven development, 1970s. Sometimes these ideas, it turns out, have a very long prehistory. What happens is they need a, a kind of an ignition point where they really take off. And that did not happen with this. And it turns out it's been reinvented and rediscovered many, many times. But here we have some really interesting observations about how this thing's, uh, stuff actually works. And when we talk about, if anybody does BDD, you may be familiar with the kind of given when then triptych, which is itself given a situation, when we do an action, then we get a result. It's a very good way to decompose and use a story. It also turns out that this was used to structure um, use cases as part of uh, Alistair Coburn's um, structure. Precondition, trigger, postcondition. But we can look, if we scratch the surface, we see it's not just to do that. It's also a way we can structure a test. And it also turns out that it dates back to what's known as Hall, a Hall triple, Tony Hall, which is often stated as PQR. Um, dates back to this paper from 1969, which dates back, which is built on an idea from a guy called Robert Floyd from the mid-1960s. And it was originally written like this. And he says, if the assertion P is true, in other words, if the precondition, if this precondition is met, then Q will work, if the, then the assertion R will be true on its completion. So if P and you execute Q, then if Q is working, you should get R. Simple as that. Given P, when Q, then R. That's it. We're done. It was, all, it was there all along. It was just hiding. So turns out testing, bug free, these are drivers. And the idea that it reduces scope, it's not just a matter of correctness. It can actually drive you to change your development process. Can I test this? No, not yet. OK, let's deliver what we have. Let's focus on what we can do. And in the next delivery, when we have a better understanding of this, we will build on that. We will build on a thing that works. It should use parsimonious abstractions as long as they don't get in the way. In other words, don't over abstract, because it's very easy to over abstract. Now, when Dick originally wrote this, he was in an era where people were concerned that people would get a little bit carried away with object orientation. They would over abstract. And you would end up with abstractions of abstractions of abstractions. I have certainly seen this. I may even been guilty, a little guilty of it myself. But honestly, most of the code that I see, I think that is the smaller problem. Most code is under abstracted. You look at most systems and you think, OK, what's the dominant type of this system? It turns out string. Most systems are stringly typed. 
Sometimes, if you're lucky, you get lists of strings. On a good day, you get a dictionary of lists. But that's on a good day. So there's a question here about quality. We talked about monolithic stuff. We talked about this idea of what happens when you get carried away. Well, not everything's going to be perfect, because we are human. We're always operating with incomplete knowledge. The second law of thermodynamics is always there. So technical debt. Shipping first-time code is like going into debt. Now, this is an interesting one, because this dates back, as you can see from the URL, to 1992. Technical debt did not become popularized as an idea until just over 10 years ago. Uh, Martin Fowler was primarily responsible for making people aware of it. But this idea had been kicking around for a while. But it's also interesting to understand what Ward was saying. Now, Ward is the, I've mentioned him before, he's the inventor of the wiki. What he observed is shipping first-time code is like going into debt. A little debt speeds development. Hmm, this is interesting. His philosophy is not that debt is bad. It's you can, debt can be OK if it's structured and understood. So long as it is paid back promptly with a rewrite. There it is. All the, yeah, technical debt was not a metaphor for describing how your system sucks. It was, a, it was a metaphor describing how to reason about it, and the answer was always there. The danger occurs when the debt is not repaid. Every minute spent on not quite right code counts as interest on that debt. There is, in other words, there's an acceptance here of exploration. You're not going to get it right first time. That's okay. You're human. Yeah, we don't know the things that we don't know. We have to build it, try it, and that's okay. But the idea is that debt was not supposed to be imagined the way that we imagine it now is just a synonym for bad code and the accumulation of it. The idea was it was a sort of an economic understanding that you, you know, you're going to get a little bit of debt, but that's fine. We often operate with a little bit of debt, and to have your debt structured in a reasonable way. Okay, I have my debt. I, you know, the biggest debt I have is uh, is my mortgage. And all you need to know about the word mortgage in English is that it's not English; it's French, and more means death. You know that so. That's, uh, that, that sets you immediately with, into the right mood. Um, so you want to structure this. Yeah, there's a, there's, a structured, there's a structured way of repaying these things. This is this whole idea is that you should be able to smoothly absorb the, 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 kind of the ebb and flow and the ins and outs of the money, but also the technical debt. You get te there's a logic here. You get technical credit as, as well. But people never talk about that. So what are we looking at? Well. Honestly, this is most microservice architectures. Um, it's not that beautiful, small amount of stones. There's beautiful pebbles arranged aesthetically. Alan Perlis, who was the first recipient of the Turing Award, in the long run, every program becomes Rococo, then rubble. It's a deeper observation on the nature of stuff and decay. So he's looking at this, and he's, he's, making, it, he's making this observation that um, takes us back into the world of the development process. Edward Berard said this at the beginning of the 1990s. Walking on water and developing software from a specification are easy if both are frozen. Which is a lovely way of putting it. Now, as we've said, everything is dynamic. We're learning all the time. This is knowledge-based. You know, we acquire knowledge not by uh, merely observing the world, but by interacting with it. You push something out there. You try and create something, and then you get stuff back. And we keep going on this cycle. So if you've not come across commit strip, oh, it's, it's great. So project manager on the left, someday we won't even need coders anymore. We'll be able to just write the specification. The program will write itself. This happens every generation. There's always something that we can get rid of the programmers. We can, have, we can have human readable code, or we'll just be able to write specifications in English, or they'll read our minds. That would be disastrous, honestly, if that ever happens. We will get the worst software ever. <laughs> so your mind is not as organized as you think it is. Oh, wow, you're right. We'll be able to write a comprehensive and precise spec, and bam, we won't need programmers anymore. Exactly. And do you know the industry term for a project specification? That is comprehensive and precise enough to generate a program. Uh, no. Code. That is what code is. Code is a precise codification of what a system should do and how it should do it. Of course, it's technical because it has detail. 
code is all about the details. You're using a formal notation that precisely says this is how it's going to work. This will be subtracted from that. This will be put into that database in this way. Yeah, and there's a lot of other stuff in there, but sometimes people go, oh, that's, that's a lot. That's too much like a machine. Honestly, it's nothing like a machine at all. The distance between modern code and what's actually going on in your processor are so far removed. They really have very little resemblance to one another at all. These are two, the world of code is a fictional world. And that's what software is, executable fiction. You get to choose how you make it. You get to choose how it's expressed. So this idea that code is actually something here. Jack Reeves made the observation in What is Software Design, 1991. Uh, C++ users, no, C++ journal, I think it was, just there. Um, and you can Google this. It's a really interesting piece because this can also be seen as the touchstone for the uh, software craftsmanship movement. It's very much a case of the value of code and the role that code plays and the importance of the focus on what is programming. Programming is not a manufacturing approach. In fact, we see this observation is not a new one at all. Because sometimes when people draw parallels, and this has been one of those issues, people say, oh, well, you know, the production pipeline um, it means that something like we, we borrow from manufacturing. And we say that programming, programming is like manufacturing. But no, it's not. Programming is the design phase. It turns out we solved the manufacturing problem a long time ago. And this is not news. Peter Now and Brian Randall, the editors of the um, software engineering conference proceedings, said the replication of multiple copies of a software system is the phase of software manufacture which corresponds to pr the production phase in other areas of engineering. They were fully aware of this in 1968. As they say, it is accomplished by simple copying operations and constitutes only a minute fraction of the cost of software manufacture. They were aware of this. Manufacturing is not programming, it's not manufacturing. Programming is designing. You're, you are actually doing the main process of creation. It turns out that the hard bit in all the other disciplines, how to create another copy of, is logistically easy. If you go to a restaurant and you say, I would like to have what she's having, they have, they have a simple choice. They can either take what she's having off her table <laughs> and bring it to you, which might not be very popular, or they can go to the kitchen and get another one but somebody has to go through the process of creation. It's a logistical exercise. I like that house. I would like to have another one like it. You know? I made the mistake earlier on of discovering, I found a beautiful guitar, custom made in Italy. Absolutely beautiful. I thought I'd, I'd contact the guy and I said, how much would that cost to make? I have a figure now. Yeah, I'm not gonna get it this year. <laughs> but it's cheaper than I thought it was. It's beautiful. But he, he says, that one's not for sale but I could make another one. You see, that's not a problem that we have in software. When somebody says, oh, that's a really cool app you've got, you've downloaded on your phone. I would like to have that as well. How do I get it? You go to the store and you download. It's not a problem. You don't have to put the bits together yourself. You don't have to create the source code yourself. If somebody says, we want what that code base does, we want exactly the same thing. It's a solved problem. Software is not the process of creating identical artifacts. Software development is the process of differentiation. We want that, but different. We want it like that, except in this way. A different technology, slightly different rules for the business, slightly different interfaces, slightly different platform. So the value of software development is the production of variation. It is not the production of identical things. That is a solved problem. Again, this was realized. But when we come to making things, and organizing the structures of our code, our modules, our stones. We propose that one begins with a list of difficult design decisions or design decisions which are likely to change. Each module is then designed to hide such a decision from the others. This is David Parnas in 1972. This is the driving force behind microservices, components, objects. It's that idea of like, there's something we're not sure about. We'll contain the thing that is unknown and wrap it with the thing that is known. The driver, oh, this is, you see, people just don't produce book covers like this anymore. <laughs> you know, covers that mess with your mind. Um, so, Tom DeMarco, structure analysis and system specification. Again, people also don't use typography like this either. Yeah. So, uh, 
again, all of these principles, we, we saw Doug McElroy talking about this. Cohesion is a measure of the strength of association of the elements inside a module. A highly cohesive module is a collection of statements and data items that should be treated as a whole because they are so closely related. Any attempt to divide them up would only result in increased coupling and decreased readability. We keep saying this. Every few years, we, we, sometimes we come up with new words, sometimes we use the same words, we use the same motivation. Readability, we've got coupling, it's all there. Oh, dependency management is important. Well, yes, it is. It always has been. Code readability, well, that's a new value. No, it isn't. So there's this, this notion that we sometimes miss these things. They were always there. So Smalltalk 80. I mentioned Simula 67. That was the granddaddy of all object-oriented languages. Smalltalk 80 was a fascinating language. Um, Developed in 1972, 76, no, 72, 74, 76, seven, and 80, I think are the right version numbers. Um, and uh, good use of typefaces there. Uh, Smalltalk was inspired by Lisp. It was built from the laws of physics, as it were, that uh, Alan Kay described. He found in Lisp, he found certain ideas. He said that these are like Maxwell's equations um, for computing and, and programming language design. Um, the idea that you could define a language in its own terms. We have compilers that are written in the language of the compiler. We have interpreters that are written in the language of the interpreter. That's kind of a weird idea when you think about it, okay? And the first time you ever encounter that, that's really strange. But this idea, this deep definition idea, something that we found in Lisp, and he explored it in small talk, it's very dynamic language. And he said, object-oriented programming to me means only messaging, local retention and protection and hiding of state process, and extreme late binding of all things. Now this is interesting <coughs> because in recent years, so this is the book I edited, Ravi mentioned, in recent years we've come to value these ideas. Um, so uh, a lot of languages tend to use threads and shared memory as the basis for concurrency which is unfortunate because threads are effectively the go-to of concurrency. Um, instead of using threads and shared memory as our programming model, we can use processes and message passing. Process here just means a protected independent state with executing code. Huh. Interesting. That seems to be surprisingly like the Alan Kay definition. Languages such as Erlang and Occam before it have shown that processes are a very successful mechanism for programming concurrently parallel systems. Now, this is really interesting because this is something we care about a great deal, partly because simplicity of composition, but also because we live in the multi-core era. And it turns out that threads, if you have threads, you need to have locks. And the purpose of a lock, the purpose of a lock, the best way to describe a lock is it's the anti-thread. Okay? The purpose of a lock is to eliminate threading. So your program is composed of uh, these warring factions. Hi, I'm a thread. I'm here to introduce concurrency. Hi, I'm a lock. I'm here to beat that guy. Yeah. Now this is really not going to be very scalable. Yeah, you, you're going to hit a limit very quickly. Yeah? And it's always worth remembering when people think, oh, "I had more locks." Always remember, all computers wait at the same speed. Okay, I'm going to add a lock to my code. It's like, yeah, I've got a three gigahertz multi-core lock. Oh, okay. Well, it runs on my machine as a two gigahertz dual-core lock. What? It doesn't make any difference. So this idea, we have started from the wrong place when we come to think of our systems and our libraries. You know, the default libraries in many languages are based on this threading model. But philosophically, all these other ideas have been around for a long time. Erlang dates back to the 80s and the 70s. Erlang is built on an actor model, which dates to 1973, Carl Hewitt and colleagues. These ideas all came out of the kind of the lisp, the small talk kind of world. Uh, they were inspired by this, informed by CSP. This is 1978, Tony Hoare again. Um, if you come across the Go programming language um, with channels, this is where channels come from. Um, so all of this stuff is it's a, a really, interesting, um, uh, really interesting history from that point of view. So this all dates back to this. Now, this is kind of an interesting one because one of the things we often associate with things like Lisp and other functional languages is this idea of lambdas. Now, there's an interesting paper from uh, um, uh, William Cook from 2009 on understanding data abstraction revisited. He explores a number of things. He talks about object orientation, other forms of data abstraction, and then makes this observation. Lambda calculus was the first object-oriented language, which is a really interesting place. This is true in two ways, but uh, the way he explores it, you look at it and you look at how he's talking about it. 
And you suddenly realize, well, OK, so Lambda Calculus, that's 1932. That's Alonzo Church. It's 1932. And it predates, if you look at it, it's actually a lot of the Lambda Calculus stuff you can do really easily in JavaScript, and which, which, which really annoys people who do Java, not just because of the name and not just because JavaScript is a kind of, yeah, it's a bit of an accident in a lot of places. But JavaScript actually is a very pure realization of some of these ideas. If you explore them, you can actually do a lot of the stuff. It actually has a truer form of lambdas than something like uh, Java or even C Sharp does. And when you start looking at it from the ground up, you suddenly realize, yeah, this is, this, these fundamental ideas were there. They were truly fundamental. However, I put, this on, I put this in here because a lot of people get very excited. They say, oh, yeah, functional programming. It's the way of the future. No, my friends, it is the way of the past. It is the way of your accounts department. It turns out there's a load of buildings, and companies, and you've got the developers go like, yeah, I'm getting into Scala, I'm getting into F Sharp, getting into Clojure. Damn, I'm so cool. Those people in the accounts department have been using Excel for years, and they have been more functional than you for a lot longer. It's a pure data flow language. Okay, Simon Payton Jones, he's Mr. Haskell. So he kind of gets to say this kind of stuff. If I say Excel is the world's most popular functional language, nothing happens. Simon Payton Joe says it, something happens. There's a point here. It also tells you about these things happen in the places you're least expecting them. Now, we're not saying it's the best functional language, but we are saying it's the most popular one. So here's a book, 1971, 71, 72, Dahl, Dijkstra, and Hoare. This is, uh, yeah, this is, uh, there's a lot, lot in this. Um, we talked about decomposition. Now, there's a, this whole problem with threading. Dijkstra makes uh, an observation, separation of tasks is a good thing. On the other hand, we have to tie the loose ends together again. Sometimes you get the sense, you know, I'm refactoring to make things smaller and smaller and smaller. It's just like, yes, but don't forget to put them back together again. And then sometimes something disastrous happens, like dependency injection. And people say, oh, it's fine. We've got this really loosely coupled code, and then we've got this gone awful XML file hiding over here that, that's so large it has its own center of gravity. <laughs> and that defines the whole system. So it turns out that your whole system is actually coupled to this XML file. Um, but there's this idea that the principle of composition, principles of composition are just as important. So Fast forward to the, the early 1990s. This is a really fascinating observation, a really interesting way of looking at things that I have found to be incredibly useful when thinking about things like concurrent design or when I'm working with threads at a lower level and then composing from them. Or when I'm not working with threads, when I'm thinking I don't know what the execution model of this is, or I'm working in a language that does not have threads, but I want to think in a time decoupled way. There's this very simple idea of a coordination language. We can build a complete programming model out of two separate pieces, the comp computation model and the coordination model. The computation model is the nice easy bits, the bits that are unit testable, the bits that are sequential, the bits that you can put in your head. And then the coordination model is the bit outside them. And I'm going to say even something like XML, um, uh, dependency-based, uh, uh, dependency injection-based um, stuff is a coordination language. But we find it elsewhere. This is an older idea. Doug McElroy, who we've heard from before. 1964, there's a copy of his memo. The relevant bit here. We should have some ways of coupling programs like garden hoses. Screw in another segment when it becomes necessary to massage data in another way. This is the way of I.O. also. This is the pipeline. This is the Unix pipeline. It turns out that. This was even before, not only before Unix, it was before Multix, which gave rise to the um, idea for Unix. Um, this was an idea in 1964 about the way we should compose concurrent programs, that we should compose them out of small pieces and then glue them together in a pipeline. And this idea is the pipeline is a coordination language. Your command shell is quite sophisticated in this way. It's also quite functional. The data flow um, is a very functional concept. It's a pure concept. There are no side effects within um, the flow within the pipeline. But what we also see here is this idea of separation. I'm going to have a way of doing something that is easy and appropriate, and then I'm going to bind it together in a different model that will deal with the hard stuff. 
like the coordination of time, rather than embed threads within the main code base. And we'll take these as two separate layers, a fundamental idea. So I'd like to close with this kind of observation that, um, again, sadly, not a new observation. I now realize I made it uh, 10 years ago. Um, sometimes people say, oh, software development is, is young. And it's not. It's, it's older than most people that I meet doing software development by a very long way. It is surprisingly old. When, in 1968, the Software Engineering Conference in Garmisch was run, most of them were complaining about the way the industry was. They were complaining like it had been going on for years, because it had been. They already knew the bad stuff. They were sick of it. They wanted to see better stuff. So it's not a question of age. It's maturity. That's slightly different. Growing old is not optional, but growing up is. We're not very good at growing up. So we are immature. We're not young. We're immature because of how we use our experience, not because we lack experience. Software runs the world. So there's no lack of software out there. There's no lack of people working in it. There's no lack of experience. But it's our question of being able to marshal our experience and create a proper knowledge-based discipline that we seem to be lacking. Thank you very much. All right, so do we have any questions uh, you'd like to raise? Okay, it looks like everyone's making a move. Okay, all those people making a move, thank you. You're leaving us more beer. <laughs> it's very generous of you. Well, there's more of where that came from. Yes, indeed. Questions, observations. I think there's a hand in the air there. Right. Excellent. Okay. I think we have a mic back. Thank you for the nice presentation. Thank you. Um, as we see nowadays, just like every couple of moments, there is a new library, there is a new programming language, there is a new framework, there is like so many things. Like my first question, would the human mind would stand to be on current with all these changes all the time? <laughs> this is the first thing. The second thing, I don't feel like this is good for the evolution of uh, software engineering and uh, technology, but I think it's just like a kind of competition that would lead to a um, paradox of choice, that we have a lot of choices yes. and then we, we spend a lot of time, we cannot choose what, what's the best thing for us, and I think it's not the right way to go forward. And yeah, maybe yeah. some thoughts on this would be great. Okay, that's a, the, yeah, so, the, so let's go back to question one. Yeah, you, nobody's going to know everything. The, the, it just don't even try keeping up. It's just not worth it. Um, just, just give up. Acknowledge that you have a boundary. Uh, acknowledge that the real trick here, and this is how we deal with knowledge when we're being effective, is that you can't know everything, but collectively a group of people can know a lot. So therefore, it becomes this idea of saying, OK, I accept that I won't be able to know everything, but I know somebody who does. I know, there's somebody who knows about this, and I know somebody else who knows about this. Or you go online and you find out somebody else knows something. In other words, this is the bit that we have kind of been getting a little bit better at. And I have to say that the ability to find um, uh, coding solutions and things like that online, whether we're talking Stack Overflow, whether we're just talking about the papers and stuff like that, the availability and the ability to search them is great. We just need to get better at searching and asking, but also drawing the limit to ourselves, saying, I accept that I cannot know everything. So that's the first thing. Now, your second point is, is a really interesting one because there is, there is this idea that we need, there needs to be some invention and reinvention and experimentation. That's one of the things that helps us move forward. But that doesn't mean that it's all good. There need, there's a, um, you can have too much of it. And as you said, competition in this model, what we've ended up with, and in fact, it, it turns out that you want to compete on the right things. Well, I don't think we're competing on the right things. Um, in other words, we don't have a model of software development and an economic model that encourages us to you know, say, yeah, that's done. <laughs> you know, we can refine that, but actually, this is where we need to be going. And what we end up doing is that the knowledge that people could have is just not, it's not, just not moving out. So there's a, a simple idea. Um, uh, from Henry Petrosky. Uh, he wrote a book in the 1990s 
um, to engineer as human. And it's called The Role of Failure in Successful Design, is the subtitle. It's a fascinating book because he's um, he is both a historian and a civil engineer. And he looks to say, how did physical engineering forms, with his particular focus on civil engineering, how did they mature? And it turns out that they generally went through a period of um, boom and bust, or a period of expansion, then failure, then consolidation. In other words, we're going to build better bridges, bigger bridges, we're going to be more adventurous with our designs. Then there's a catastrophe, a disaster, and everybody suddenly regulates very heavily, becomes a little more conserved in their design, and then there's a period of kind of stability, and then people start experimenting again until you reach the next wave, and so on. Now, what we see in software is we are missing the periods of consolidation. It's, it's, we are continually expanding, but we're not getting the periods of consolidation that would normally, if you like, be a little more Darwinian, that would normally say, yeah, let's get rid of that, that idea doesn't work. This idea is not a good one. This idea is bad for businesses, or it's bad for people, it's bad for politics, it's bad for companies, it's bad for software. Let's get, and, and that there's some cost associated with that, but what we're missing is a, is a negative cost. When something is growing so fast, software is eating the world, then it has no, there's, there's, no, there's nothing consolidating it. If software slowed down the way that construction slows down, then it's likely that we would be in a very different place. So there is, some of it's the economics, some of it is, um, and some of it is how we have conceived of this as a discipline. So yeah, I, there is that. We're missing the consolidation periods. Any other questions, thoughts, reflections? I can put the Hamlet advert up again, you know. <laughs> then, uh, According to what you have said, this means like we could reach explosion phase before we reach the consolidation phase. Yes. And then this would impact our humanity to a great, because we software eat oh, the world and yes, yes. we are living, everything's oh, yes. moving with software. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's oh, I, yeah. I do a number of talks on software failure. I have a very interest, very strong interest in failure. In fact, we can actually even cut to a small subsequence because I, I, my name has become associated with failure, it turns out, um, which is, you know, it, I, I'm not entirely sure how I feel about that one. Um, but it kind of starts with, um, I, you know, I like taking photographs of uh, failed software. Um, and I've taken various pictures. Um, so, for example, in public spaces, you know, this is, uh, yeah, I observe that we are producers of a great deal of installation art around the planet. Um, but what is interesting is when you look at these things and you see how they fail. There you go. Disappointingly, I had to renew my subscription sooner than that. But you look at that and you see the nature of failure. You, everybody's favorite is the discovery that NAN is everywhere. Um, apparently null is quite popular too. Um, and you know, with a number of sites that if you, if you say, if you went to a company and said, could you tell us how you build your software? And they would say, no, that's our secret. No, it's easy. If you want to find out the uh, architecture of, of a, a piece of software, you go to the website. So, you know, so what we so I've got I've got very keen on doing this but it's now got to the point that people actually send me this stuff. <laughs> so I don't have to take any more pictures. People now send and people send them to my Twitter account and I retweet them. And uh, and it, it's kind of got to the level um, it, it's sort of got a little bit out of hand that um, a couple of years ago one guy said, arriving in Bologna, I saw a Kevlin Henny screen. I am now a word whilst queuing to leave Ancona. And another appeared as I waited. I like the possible threat. You're never safe from a Kevlin Henny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this, this has started to become a thing. Um, it's even made it to the register. 
So for Christmas, there was a song, blah, blah, blah. First thing I trashed, da, 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 made three Kevlin Hennies at Waterloo Station. <laughs> a Kevlin Henny is a humiliating public software failure photographed and tweeted to the eponymous account. Kevlin Hennies are frequently seen at ATM machines and supermarket checkouts, but the best ones usually occur at transport hubs where they enjoy the full benefit of giant displays. <laughs> and I, apparently, it's even trans somebody put me in Urban Dictionary now. Um, so, you know, it's now, so a couple of years ago at Agile in the city in Bristol, the organizer said, there's a Kevlin Henney screen downstairs. I want to take a picture of you in front of it, and then I'll tweet it, and then you retweet it. There'll be this kind of recursion. Um, so we did it again the year after. <laughs> and then I was at Dev Turdity, and this was just the last week, kind of looking a little bit bemused, you know. Um, so, yeah, there is, uh, you know, so it, it's, now, it's now become a thing. So I'm, I'm fascinated because the point here is that we keep seeing these failures in public places. I'm very interested in um, these, and a lot of them are attributable to very small, very small errors. Some of them are very subtle, but some of them are easily prevented, uh, very easily prevented. Some of them, many of them you can actually say, wait a minute, I know what kind of thing caused that bug. I know how to test that. Okay, you look at and and it has larger impact. Um, so, we've seen this. Um, let's put it this way: where we talk about defects, what is a bug in a system? A bug is basically an increase in the in the attack surface area of a system. Okay, the, a defect is a way in, and this allows and this basically becomes critical. The more we combined systems, the more important this is. This leads to the WannaCry virus and all these kinds of things that they are able to exploit this. They lead to accidental failures. You know, there have been companies that have gone out of business because of spreadsheet errors. Um, uh, there have been companies that have gone out of business because uh, there was um, uh, the uh, case of Knight Capital um, seven years ago. They went out of business because of a faulty deployment and a, dead, and a piece of dead code and they managed to accidentally spend billions of dollars that they did not have in a very short period of time. Um, rockets have fallen from the sky as a result of very simple errors that you could catch in a code review, um, and we are seeing this more and more. So these are, so this is something to be concerned about because a number of these things do start affecting us. We've seen it as well. I mentioned spreadsheet errors before. We're, there's often a lot of talk and concern about austerity economics. The whole austerity economics concept comes from a paper in 2011, if I remember correctly, that was an error. It had, it, they, in their calculations, they used a spreadsheet and they missed off five rows. And it turns out that rather than an economy contracting under the circumstances, they said, oh, the economy will shrink. You know, in the, under these circumstances, an, a, a nation's economy will shrink by a small percentage. It turns out that if you include those five rows, the economy actually grows. The whole of austerity economics is based on an Excel error. So this is kind of concerning. So it's already entered. We are already in the space that it is affecting, um, you know, without even worrying about human exploitation of these weaknesses. We are already in a space where um, it turns out that these errors, these oversights, can have huge consequences that are far larger than you'd anticipate. You say, ah, oh, it's just a line of code. What harm could it do? You know, it's, uh, you know there's a, uh, and we talk about coding practice and stuff like that. The, uh, there was the example, um, let me think, there was, in terms of security errors. We were talking about the 1960s and structured programming. XKCD, I could restructure the program's flow or use one little go-to instead. Ah, screw good practice. How bad could it be? Go-to. Okay, so let's talk about Apple and um, their secure socket layer, the go-to-fail bug. A little bit of a mistake here. They put two things there. This could have been caught by tests. It could have been caught by code review. It could have been caught by uh, static analysis. It could have been caught. Um, huge, huge issue in 2014 in terms of security. So there we have the answer. <laughs> now, this is the point. This is the point, is that these failures are disproportionate to the causes of the failure. We normally think big failures require big causes. Big effect, big cause. That's the problem with software, is it doesn't. And therefore, we're in a very poor position to judge 
the fact that these very minor, you don't know that that minor problem is a minor problem. Yeah? And often what happens, as many of these do, they're, they're, they're what I refer to as perfect storms. Because it's not normally one thing, one thing that causes the problem. It's not normally one thing or another, it's one thing and another. Just in that moment, if you have enough software and it's run frequently enough that accidentally the thing that could never happen or could rarely, rarely happen, happens. And we see all kinds of situations where that occurs. There are loads of oversights, loads of mistakes. So yes, I think we are, when we talk about it, you know, I mean, it's a bit dramatic, but hey, it's in the evening. It, you know, it's, it's only Tuesday. We've got to have some drama in the week. Yeah, we could induce a kind of, you know, civilization extinction level event um, through software. Yeah. So, you know, just, yeah, right. So, you know, so, so just, I don't, don't want, that could sound depressing, but, you know, I want you to sound inspirational instead. It's just like, yes, we can solve this, because it is solvable. I do believe it is genuinely solvable.